I think right now, like the top performing company in our portfolio doesn't have a website, uh, you know, doesn't have a logo, um, has never been, doesn't, there's nothing about it on LinkedIn. It employs, I don't know, a few dozen people. None of, I don't think any of them, ha there's nothing about it online. And yet it's raised three rounds of financing now and it has a great valuation and products incredible, huge traction. So, and, you know, it has basically defied all of the ideas that, you know, reading about entrepreneurship or going to conferences like slush you if you're a young person and you just hear you think oh this is the way i should do it i should apply for y combinator right and i don't know it's just like but that's also when you see i call them warp pipes you know based on this guy shane snow's idea of uh you know you play super mario brothers and i think you know it's in his book um smart cuts but there's this uh you know, he tells the story of his roommate who basically, essentially, uh, played the world record uh, in Super Mario Brothers by playing through the game, uh, basically completing the entire game in the in the shortest amount of time in the world. And I think the previous world record was like 36 minutes, and he did it in I don't know five minutes and 30 seconds. And he was able to do this because he used warp pipes, which. I mean, uh, I, as a, I'm a, being a Super Mario Generation guy, which I recognize you probably aren't, <laughs> uh, I always thought they were put in by the game designers so that people, testers who were playing the game could skip levels. So, you know, at the end of Super Mario Brothers, if you hop on this elevator at the end of level one, you can go up above the entire game field and then you can basically like run all the way to the end of the level like kind of where the scores are, you know, at where you're not supposed to be able to go, right? And then you get into this special thing where you can use warp pipes to skip levels. So um, using those, it's cheating, right? total cheating. Um, you're not supposed to do that, or are you? And this is something, this happens uh, in VC too, right? So occasionally you get this founder that's using warp pipes to skip all the normal process and raises money like that. Um, and you're grateful that you were able to get into that deal. And that's what the VCs are looking for. And those founders have this kind of traction, right? And so when that happens is, you know, the VC t hops on a plane if needed, um, you know, desperately, try desperately tries to get an intro. So it completely turns around. Suddenly now you have VCs pitching the founder. Um, and then, you know, the idea is like, I remember I was, I was uh, spending a weekend with a friend before I came here to Helsinki in Big Sur. And he said, well, he was pitching this... Um, and recent a firm in, in the Valley that I'm sure you know well. And uh, he said, well, I was like, how did that process go? And well, I was like, it was really fast. Um, I was invited to the partner meeting and then I had the term sheet in my email before the Uber arrived to pick me up after the meeting. So it can be really fast uh, because you really want that deal. And as a VC, you need to, that's the moment of sheer terror for the VC. It's right when you suddenly realize, now I got to move. And so as a founder, you want to be the catalyst for that kind of moment in the VC's brain. And it doesn't come unless, number one, uh, you have this kind of idea that matches what we just talked about, right? Because the VC is doing, it's, it's you know, the gears are grinding in, in my brain when you pitch me and I'm thinking, is this going to return my fund 3X, right? And then the second thing is, is this founder obviously going to lead this company to a massive exit? And then thirdly, um, you know, where is the necessary financing going to come, the follow-on financing to get this there, right? Is it going to come from customer revenue or do I need to look at my friends, the bigger VCs, and figure out which ones of them are going to be, you know, a match in order to fund the, you know, like my friend Blake Scholl is building a supersonic jet. Boom, supersonic, right? Imagine, or I'm, you know, I, I invest in a company called ISAI uh, here in, in Helsinki that uh, makes radar satellites, right? So you can already tell that those companies are going to need more follow on financing than Rahul, who's, who's building an email client, Superhuman, or, um, you know, Ulf Schwiekendik, who's building, uh, you know, meditation productivity app called Centered. Um, these are SaaS businesses that. But again, so, you know, it, 
you can build both kinds of companies, but you're going to need to raise from people who are aligned with that. Like in the case of uh, ISI, probably couldn't have invested that from YesVC, but True Ventures has a fund that is actually set up for something like that because the fund size is right. Um, you know, they have the capability to do the kind of follow-ons that are needed when you need to raise more money to launch satellites. And fundamentally, you know, you look at a business like that and you're like, oh, radar satellites, really, really, really hard technology to create and expensive. So, but generates data, right? So you're not just selling satellites. You're gonna have this that satellite in the air that's gonna be taking pictures through the clouds at nighttime, providing completely reliable 24 seven coverage of any spot on the earth. Whereas any normal satellite that's using a camera, 70% of the time can't image anything because there's clouds or it's dark, right? Because the cameras just can't see through the clouds, right? It's just logic, right? So, oh, if you've got a satellite that can see through clouds, that's probably pretty valuable. And then if it's the only satellite that can see through the clouds, it's probably even more valuable, right? And so just from that perspective, then from a VC, you're like, oh, this is interesting because wow, like this could be super valuable, right? And so, and what's not to like, because also it's really hard to copy. Um, so it's justified to invest tens of millions of dollars into something like that, because you realize that it's also building this moat that's making it increasingly difficult for others. And you realize that the value that you're getting out of it could still return that kind of multiplier because it could be so incredibly valuable, right? So, um, you know, you can just plug this into a spreadsheet. And I think it's fun also to, as a founder, I just recommend it. It's like, I run a cafe. So this is the other thing. It's like, I, you know, expose yourself to multiple things. It used to be like VCs always would say, you have to put all your eggs in one basket as a founder. You you know, we get to do a portfolio, but you as a founder, you have to focus on your own company, right? I don't think that's bullshit. You know, as a founder, you should be proliferating. You should be angel investing if you can. You should be exposing yourself to other founders. Start multiple companies. I think that's great. So, um, you know, and I run a cafe, <laughs> but it gives me incredible information advantage because now, like I just got pitched, uh, I don't know, like a time management solution for small businesses. I can just test it out with my employees and I can see what works and what doesn't. And I can actually evaluate these deals because frankly, I'm a customer. So that's another thing is like, if you are a founder and this is what I call these soda straw links, it's the best founders are always connecting in social networking terms to communities, right? Uh, like for instance, let's say cafe owners and website or you know online internet technology companies, right? So these typically don't really overlay, right? Not many cafe owners are also Silicon Valley tech company builders, right? But when as a VC like I am, now I can be my own customer, right? And so I can see from my personal experience, what works and what doesn't. And so as a founder, I think that's why I'm also saying, especially as a young founder, you know, trying out and being, wearing multiple hats at the same time is great because it gives you this ability to work as this sort of soda straw link that's, you know, basically connecting to networks that would otherwise not be connected.